Hey, if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Isaiah 43, which is where they got the words. Go ahead and dismiss Sunday school. Go learn about Jesus. Everybody say, God bless our Sunday school. Amen. Help them to be biblical, godly citizens. Lord knows our country needs some. Hallelujah. But I didn't know they were going to sing that song this morning. We're, we're, we're way too, Sister Crow and I are way too busy. And I, they, and, 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 but I actually have in my text the portion of scripture that they wrote that song from. Isaiah 43, verses 1 and 2. Hallelujah. Hey, I'm up here. I'm hot and I'm preaching. But man, that air is cold. Are y'all okay? All right, chill that out. Hello? Well, no, don't chill it out. It's chilled out. We want to turn the heat up in here. No, I don't literally mean the heat. I mean spiritually. Isaiah 43. Now, you got to stay with me here. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob. Now that, to us, that kind of confuses us. But I'm going to explain something here in a minute about that. And he that formed thee, O Israel. He's still talking about the same guy. But if you don't know the story, you don't understand the psalm. Are you hearing me? Remember Jacob, when he wrestled? He wrestled all night. Now, Jacob was never the best guy. In fact, <laughs> he's a good liar. <laughs> if there's such a thing, he's a good liar. But God changed his name because something got a hold of him that caused him to get a hold of what God was doing in his life. I'm going to hurt some of your feelings because some of you got an idea that God can only work with good people. God was, oh, see, I'm just going to, see, so, some of you are so upset, you don't want that person that lied to you or stole from you to make heaven, but God, God, God don't care if you don't like him, he's going to save them. He may have to save them from lying, but he had to save you from, he changed his name from Jacob to Israel. He changed his name from liar to prince with God. Now, that sounds good, but let me explain it even better. That makes it means he's the son of a king. Oh. Uh -huh. Come on. Come on. Yes. Yes. He went from liar to the son of, not just the king, the king of kings. Yes. That ought to make you stand up and say, I'm not letting go of this thing today. I want to be blessed of God. I, I'm ready for a name change because I'm ready for a character change. I'm ready for a life change. I'm ready for a direction change. Are you hearing me? Fear not. He told, oh, Israel, he told, hey, son, daughter, fear not. I have, for I have redeemed thee. I ransomed you. That word redeem literally means ransom to do the part of the next of kin. <laughs> now, I don't know. Only our Bible study people I understand. So you're like, man, what's he talking about? Are you hearing me? He, he, he took a liar and turned him into a prince. Uh, that's what God does when he takes a sinner and he turns him into a born again saint of God. Mm. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm a, I'm a son or daughter of the king. He goes on to say, I have called thee by thy name. Look at this. Thou art mine. Mm. Isn't that awesome? Mine. God's possessive. Oh, Lord. If some of you would see that in your life, like you do some of your stuff. See, y'all know Pastor Crow at home, I hide food. I hide food. Why? Because if I don't, it's, then is it really mine? No. <laughs> 
I know I'm not letting it go to somebody else. I'm making sure. I like how God, how sometimes he's got to take us and hide us in the cleft of the rock. Or, or hide us in that secret place. I, I, you don't understand why I like prayer and why I'm thankful for the house. Because you don't know. I'm his. And he said, he says, you're mine. You need to get a hold of this today. He says, you're mine. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He's going to change your name from what you were to what he wants you to be. He's going to redeem you. He's going to say, you're mine. I don't understand why people don't want to live for a God like that. Here's here's where those words that song comes from. When thou passest through, not if. (laughs) When thou passest through the water, I will be with thee. Don't Peter know that a little bit? And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou, not if, <laughs> when thou walkest through the fire, thou shall not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, glory. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. I'm going to read another verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13, and then we'll go before the Lord in prayer. Every man's work, everybody's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it. Because it shall be revealed by fire. Mm. Not if. Shall be. See, in the world, To the sinner, to the lost, fire's a problem. (laughs) But in the church, fire's a revealer. I could go so many directions with that, but we're just going to try to stay in this because I don't want to be here till 2 o'clock. 1 o'clock is okay, but (laughs) 2. We got to beat the Baptist, the Shonies, or the Black Bear, wherever y'all going. And the fire shall try every man's work, what sort it is. The ESV says each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. Let's put our Bibles down. Let's lift our hands, our hearts, our spirits, our voices. A spirit of expectation, Jesus, right now, we need you, God. We need to hear from you. We need a a, a sure word right now. We need a suddenly word. We need need a word right now from you, God, to help us in the time of need. We we need an interaction, Lord. We we, we need an encounter with your presence and your power. We've gone, gone through some stuff. We're going through some stuff. We're facing some things right now, God. We need you, oh, Lord. We gotta have you, God, today. We look for you. We reach for you, God. We believe, we trust, and we rely upon you, Lord. Anoint this house with your presence, your provision, and your power. And everybody said in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Oh, let's give the Lord a hand. Praise. Amen. Well, you're seated. I wanted to lengthy portion of scripture I want to read to you in Daniel chapter 3 just a couple of verses verse 19 of Daniel chapter 3 amen then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury it's kind of neat because 
our text in Psalms was dealing with one king, and now we're dealing with another king, and we have two different reactions from these kings. This king's a little schizo right now. He's a little upset. And the form of his visage was changed. Y'all seen that? Probably in your spouse. <laughs> the devil is a liar. Tell the truth. Y'all can't pull the wool over the pastor's eyes. I've been around some of y'all and you lost it. <laughs> yeah. Was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men. Everybody said the most mighty men. These were the baddest of the bad that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hose, and their hats, and their other garments and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew, remember them baddest of the bad, men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they fell. They fell. The enemy is still the enemy. See, we, we like to deny ever falling. You know why some of you never get the healing you want? You never be honest that fact that you got some sickness. You know, no, you, you know why some of you never get anointed like you wanted? Because you try to act like you already are. Well, man, Pastor, what are you doing preaching like this for? Get back on the fun stuff. Man, this is the fun stuff when you get this. I don't know about hurting your feelings. <laughs> don't hurt your thought process and help you think and realize God's for you. They fell down, bound, into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. They bound them and threw them. You know, isn't that crazy? You're going to throw them in a fiery furnace. What do you have time up for? What? You... Son of a thought. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished or astonished and rose up in haste. He jumped up and spake and said unto his counselor. See, even kings need counselors. <laughs> Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, true, O king. He answered and said, lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire. And they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said. <laughs> you're, hey, King, you're talking to people that you just tried to kill. You ever wonder why the devil still talks to you when you're going through it? Because he realizes it didn't stop you. It didn't kill you. The devil's still talking. He's still getting on to you. He's still trying to mess with you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? But I like how he, how he addresses him. Ye servants of the most high God, come forth and come thither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth. They, they were walking with the king of kings. Notice he had to ask him to come out. Sometimes you need to realize 
Some of your best places with God is in the fire. Some of your closest walks with Jesus is why you're in the worst time of your life. Sometimes you need to realize that when you're going through your worst, most pressured times, that's when you're walking with Jesus closer than ever before. Then yes. mm. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abendo came forth of the midst of the fire and the princes, governors, and captains and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power. Like I said, fire in here is different than fire out there. Yes. Nor was a hair on their head singed, neither were their coats changed nor the smell of the fire had passed on them. You know, I don't know about you, but I've lived long enough to know there's nothing that'll get your attention like a fire. As a child, I remember being on a, a school bus heading for school and a flatbed pickup truck had caught on fire while he was driving and flames were pouring out of the front of that truck and all of a sudden he stopped in the middle of the road and we're all just like, you know, go looking at this, and the guy jumps out, and he, he's, he's running around trying to do something. Then our, our bus driver, Mr. Brewer, grabbed the fire extinguisher out of the, uh, the bus and ran over and gave it to him. Mr. Brewer got back in the, the bus and started taking us. He drove around taking us, and we're all just like, yeah, I, I remember as a kid uh, uh, on our farm, we, uh, we had an orchard, and we used to be able to... Our dad would set us up to sit on a picnic table and watch the levees and shoot the ground squirrels that were taking the walnuts. One day I was out there and, man, I saw a big old, I saw Peter Rabbit come out. He was fat and sassy. And I said, oh, yeah, I'm about to show dad a trophy. I, I, I drew a bead down on him and I fired and I watched him hop away and hop down a hole. I was so upset that he got away. He stole my fire. So I thought, I'll fix him. I ran to one of the little outhouses, the little barns we had there, and I, I grabbed a gas can and some lighter, and I went and I went and poured that gas down that hole. Now, I know my little sister probably watching, but I did get away with this one. I poured, I, I poured the gas down that hole, took it through a match in there. That fire about blew me back, man. About put me on the other one. See, because some people don't know what happened. See, gas isn't just ignitable. It's explosive. It generates... You hear what I'm saying? Alcohol just burned, but gas, you know, I, I, I'm lucky I didn't just disfigure and remove every bit of hair. My eyebrows, see, y'all, I almost lost eyebrows back in the day. Y'all shaving them off now, but I just, <laughs> boom, that thing blew up. I, and all of a sudden, all that grass is on fire, and I'm out there putting that fire out. Fire will get your attention. Fire, fire will get you to move like you've never moved before. Fire will wake you up from a stupor. Are you hearing what I'm what I'm saying? It gets our attention. We'll all stop and watch a fire. We'll, we'll see a house on fire. We'll all be, oh, oh. We all. <laughs> but in our passage today, we find three men who faced a fire. And unlike most fires that, that we see, these men had a choice as to whether or not they fire most of the time we don't have a choice fiery trials come our way issues problems and troubles seemingly out of nowhere light our world on fire turn our lives into an inferno now we're warned about fire in first peter chapter four it says beloved think not strange concerning the fiery trial You've been around church people long enough, they'll tell you, man, I'm in a fiery trial. I'm in a fire. I'm facing some fire. I'm facing some stuff. This, this isn't just a, a little tiptoe through the tulips. This, my world's on fire, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice. What? Rejoice about a fire? My life looks like it's burning down. You want me to rejoice? <laughs> I like that laugh, brother. That was a laugh of, been there, done that. Mm. But rejoice in so much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, 
ye may, may be glad also with exceeding joy. See, some of you live through the joy of never going through anything. You got that little anemic Christianity. You just come in, show up, find a seat in the church, and you're not involved in anything else. Your joy is a joy of absence. Whereas people that trust God and allow God to take them through a fire, they get an exceeding joy. You want to know who those people are? Those are the people that are shouting. Those are the people that are dancing and clapping and running. Though they're in the fire, they understand, wait a minute. God's doing something in my life right now. I'm being purified. I'm being sanctified. I'm being just. You can judge me because I'm going through something. Or you can judge me realizing God's purifying something. I'm happy about that because he's still with me in the fire. Though I go through the, oh, though I go through the fire, I'm not going to be burnt. I'm still going to be here. Yes. Oh, y'all don't see. See, see, see. Mm. See, it was their choice. They chose. A fire's not something we normally choose. That's why it's like, well, you know, I really don't want to teach Bible studies or try to witness anymore. I don't want to try to win. I love anybody. Man, there's a conflict. There's fire there. Mm -hmm. So, scripture we know reminds us about those fiery trials when they come our way. Most of the time they do catch us off guard. Most of the time we feel very unprepared. But you need to understand something about your enemy. He only fights where he fears. See, see, that that's a bully. I remember, I remember as a kid when we, we moved to England and uh, we just brand new in a new neighborhood and, and uh, I, I stepped out and I saw this toe-headed blonde kid across the way. So I go over to meet his name's Jason and we're hanging out, and he said, and I was fixing to go, and he said, hey, man, hold on. We're all going to play British Bulldog over here in this little green they got, and it was a, a circular park area. It wasn't big, you know, just enough for a bunch of kids to play in. But I was a new kid, so everybody's meeting me, and all of a sudden, we're all hanging out, and everything's fun, and all of a sudden, everybody just changed. Everybody just changed how they were acting. Oh, man, Paul's coming. Paul's coming. I'm like, what? And I turn around and he's this big old fat kid. <laughs> well, I, I recognized his physical appearance because I knew my physical appearance. You know, I'd be lucky to intimidate a straw. <laughs> my mom used to say, Man, you look like you got a hanger stuck in your chest. <laughs> you know, the little bumps, right? <laughs> Anybody remember when you, you, you could see them bumps in your... I wish I could see them now, but you know. <laughs> he used to have stomach muscles too, but, well, they don't, you know. So this guy shows up, and who does he make a beeline for? He just comes in and takes over everything that's going on, tells everybody what to do, and all of a sudden he sees me. Oh, man. But what does a bully want to do? He wants to make sure you get in line. He wants to, oh, no, you're going to be another one of my sons. Isn't that what a trial's trying to do to you? Isn't that what you're affect? Oh, no, you're not going to be a worshiper. You're not going to be a believer. The devil wants to stop you from having faith in God. So this guy can, oh, no, I'm, you're going to be another one of my neighborhood subjects. And I'm standing there, and he starts giving me the what for. And I'm like, no, no, man, I, I don't want to die today. So I'm turning around to leave, and my older sister said, what are you doing? I said, I'm going home. He said, you better not. You better fight him. She said it out loud in front of everybody. What? And I'm like, man, I'll slap you. We're siblings. We'll fight. I turned around, and he got this big old grin on his face. But now, now, there was no retreating with honor. Now, they all, ain't nothing but embarrassment. It was lose, lose. So here I am with my little retainer. You know, come on. Yeah. You know. I said, I'll be right back. Ran in the house. Because, you know, it's one thing to get in a fight. It's another thing for mom and dad to have to pay that retainer bill. You know what 
I'm saying? Put that thing in that little glass of water I had by the sink, and I went back out there, and everybody ate. I think it was a Super Bowl. I'm like looking around. I'm going to die in front of all these people. Yeah, I'm thinking I'm walking into the gladiator pit, and, you know, and I ain't going to come out like Russell Crowe. I'm going to die. There's tigers and lions and there's gladiators. I'm fixing to die in this dirt. I didn't go in there all big and bad. I wasn't confident. I was scared to death. I didn't go in there like, yeah, I'm going to Jackie Chan, Bruce Lee, this guy. No. <laughs> now, my dad was military. He had us in karate, but that didn't mean nothing to me, but I knew a Chinese word. That was it, man. You know, I did my katas and stuff like that, but we never had that full contact stuff like they allow you today. You know, I'm there. I knew martial art dancing is what I knew. Dancing wasn't going to help me because this fool's fixing to hurt me. So anyway, we could kind of square up in there, and he's got this big smile on his face. And I like to tell you I knew that I, I went ahead and I ridge hand or I kicked him or I front kicked him or I roundhouse. I don't even know what I did. I closed my eyes, and I started swinging, and the next thing you know, someone's arms are grabbing me off that fat fool, and I'm waylaying him. I said all that to sometimes when you're facing some things, you ain't got a plan. You don't know what you're, you best just start swinging. You best just start fighting. I, I, this ain't going to be pretty, but I'm not going down without a scrap. <laughs> I may go through the fire. I may die, but I'm not going in the fire without fighting. Man, we better get back in the word of God. Y'all, that, that ain't nothing to shout. I will, I will say this. We lived there a little bit and we moved away. And I remember it was about a year, two years later. My, my physique hadn't changed any. Looked like a clothes, clothes rack, you know. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a chest, brother. I had ribs. I had ribs. <laughs> I had ribs. I had ribs. I, had... <laughs> I remember I'm walking up with some friends. We're going to a dance. Because, you know, what? Y'all said, no. <laughs> I can't see Brother Crow dancing. I don't care. <laughs> I come walking up to the entrance of the dance. Got my, got my little ticket. A couple of friends with me. And there's Big Paul. You know, he's sitting on his bike. Future Fonzie right there. Because you. I'm walking up. I'm like, oh, man. I'm, I'm scared to death. I'm like, man, I got lucky. And I am fixing to. F I remember walking up. So what I do? Took the biggest breath I could to make it look like I had a chest. <laughs> Stood tall. Thank God. Thank God I had some height. Walking up. Come on, fellas. I put on a good front. That old boy was like, hi, Steve. Still had him beat. <laughs> 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 you you, you got to send a message to your enemy. I'm going to fight. <laughs> and you'll stop yourself from having to fight that fool again because he realizes you will fight anyway. <laughs> the devil fights what he fears. Your enemy fights what he fears. He fights those he's worried about. He didn't like Job's dedication. He got a hedge around him. But he wanted to attack him. The devil fights where he's worried. The devil attacks you because your territory he wants. That's why your house can be in an uproar. That's why your relationships with your loved ones are like. Man, our house is like the UFC. Come on, don't lie, some of y'all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got the head bob and the hand. You walking out, not talking to one another, walking by, shouting and saying, Oh, I'm going to tell Pastor you said that. 
Oh. <laughs> you ain't even married yet, brother. You have no idea. <laughs> Your finances have been attacked. You, he'll attack your body. He'll attack your mind. Because he knows if he can get in your spirit. He's afraid of you. He wants to put you in the fire because he's worried if you ever catch on fire. He's afraid that if you get it like John the Baptist prophesied. See, that's the difference. That's the problem with the New Testament church. See, the Old Testament, Tabernacle, they had fire falling. But a lot of these churches up and down the streets here, they call themselves churches, but there's no fire in there. See, John the Baptist prophesied in Matthew 3 and 11, I indeed baptize you with water. See, he even explained it, but those, those jokers in, in Acts 19 kind of missed it and had to get rebaptized because they didn't know whether there'd be any Holy Ghost. But John the Baptist said, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Hallelujah. And with fire. And with fire. You got the Holy Ghost. Oh, how, to, how, how do firemen defeat fire? They get ahead of it and burn it, light a fire, and let the fire meet the other fire, and that fire wins. It puts it out. You want to defeat the fire in your life? Get on fire. The devil knows he can't handle you on fire. The devil knows he can't handle you when you're committed to the things of God. The enemy knows I can't have that territory if it's on fire. So he wants you complacent. He wants you comfortable. He wants you content because then he's got you beat. He don't care that you come in here and sit all cutesy and all nice. Mm -hmm. He's worried because if you ever prayed like you know how in trouble there's no one that can pray like you that'll shout like you there's no one that can worship like you used to worship there's no one that would glorify God like you used to glorify God so he wants you sitting there looking all pretty and more worried about the people around you think than what God's doing well there ought to be something about every one of us that realizes you know what God's worthy of my praise yes. God's worthy. I don't care what I'm going through. I want to be on fire in my worship. I want to be a fire on my commitment. There's something. We ought to all right now say, you know what? God, I'm committed. I'm on fire. I'll stir up myself, that gift that was in me. I'm going to get on fire. The devil can't handle me, can't handle us when we get on fire. The devil don't want to mess with you when you get real with this thing. Some of you ought to reclaim your homes and get in there and get on fire. Devil, you're not allowed in here. Some of you ought to worship and shout and fill your mind with the word of God. You can't have my mind. You can't have my heart. You can't have my family. You can't have my life. You can't have me. I'm his. He says, I'm his. You ought to reestablish that declaration. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's still true. <coughs> you can be seated because honestly, some people don't need a battle to backslide. <laughs> they didn't call. You missed my text. They didn't shake my hand. Full of some silly little complaints. Missed church for a month. Ain't been to a Wednesday night service in weeks. Some folks disappear if you call for a time of consecration and commitment. Those are the ones that blame everybody else for everything that's wrong in their own life. I got a hang up because of them. They point out and remember every little thing about others. But 
nothing about themselves. Well, if pastor was this way and pastor did it that way and if Sister Crow would do this and if the, if the singers would sing that and if the... Come on, you do it here because you do the same thing at home. Man, this house would be better if y'all would... Why don't y'all... It's you, it's you. Look, I, I can't talk about overcoming if we don't be honest about needing to overcome some things. Mm. Let me tell you something. If your problem is other people, you've lied to yourself. I can tell you right now where you can find your biggest problem. It's in your bathroom. It's that great big old mirror. Oh, yeah, and it's going to point to directly the greatest problem in your walk with God is you. Don't blame pastor. Don't blame your job. Don't blame busyness. Why? Why you don't have a prayer life where you're not reading your Bible. Why you're running around doing all these other things but not the things of God. Not too long ago, someone came to me. I'm going to get back, back to what I've been called to be. I've been back. And they ain't hardly been to what, what, three or four services since they said it. Man, I can't believe he just said that out loud. You said it out loud. Well, you want me? I'm not playing with your soul. You are. Oh, God. I say that because then there are some people. That's why I miss Sister Davenport right now. Because you know what? Some of y'all miss over the silliest. My eye hurts. I got a headache. Sister, what's this Davenport? I have to count when they miss because I can't count when they're here. It's too much. And yet, here they are. I'll tell you, she is sick today. Because I, I have confidence in that. Because she don't regularly met. But there's some of you, man, I, I don't even look for you. It's when you're here, like, wow, they're here. Because that's the paradigm you created. And trust me, if I see it, he sees, God sees, there's nothing hid from him. So if I realize the deficiency, where do you think you stand with the things of God? So I'm thankful right now for those people that no matter what they go through, no matter what you do to them, no matter what happens, they're unfazed. I'm going to be in church. In fact, I'm not just going to be in church. I'm going to be worshiping. They're going through hell and high water. They're still singing. They're still preaching. They're still praying. They're still on fire. I thank God for those that no matter what kind of torment and trouble, they still got their testimony. Oh, and all those people ought to shout right now. You ought to walk around ready for the fight. You ought to be right there always ready with worship, always ready to praise and sing and to shout. Why? Because I got to walk with God. And so the enemy will always regret Every time he messes with folks like that. Oh, God, I wish I never would have touched them. My God, now they're worshiping. Now they're shouting. Now they're teaching Sunday school. Now they're teaching Bible studies. The more afflicted they got, the more anointed they became. <laughs> the more problems I put on them, the more powerful they became. Oh, y'all missing how God does this. I'm talking about those folks that walk around on fire. You ever notice when you walk around on fire, you offend those that are not? Oh, 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 oh. yeah, you want to draw the ire of the carnal? Talk about God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When Satan attacks these kind of folks, that attacks become fuel for their fire. When all hell is breaking loose, they still show up. They're still praying. You can count on them even when it's difficult. And the more you afflict them, the more they multiply. We got any folks like that in here today? We got anyone in here like that? Hallelujah. That you want to say, if it had not been for the affliction, I wouldn't be anointed. Uh, 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 I'm going to say something. I thank God for my affliction. I thank God for the trouble. It gave me my testimony. I thank God for the affliction. It got me anointed. It caused me to rise up. Oh, the enemy messed with the wrong one when he messed with you. He messed with the wrong one when he afflicted you. Because now you're worshiping like nobody else. You're shouting. 
way nobody else will. You're praising the way you praise. You're living the way you live. I clap this way because I've been on fire. I'm not watching golf. I'm not watching sports. I'm involved with the King of Kings and the Lord God. That's why I shout like I shout. That's why I worship like I worship. My enemy made a fighter out of me. Oh, something. The best thing you ever did is hit a bully in the nose. Anytime he wants to walk into your house and cause a problem, you punch that devil right in the nose. Anytime he wants to step into your fire, you punch him right. You ain't going to stop me from giving. You ain't going to stop me from being faithful. Uh-uh. In fact, you, go, you, you done mess with the wrong territory. I'm going to witness to five people this week. I'm going to teach an extra body. I'm going to worship right there. See, there are those kind of people that the affliction brings a greater anointing. You don't understand, really. I didn't get here on easy street. I walked a pathway of fire. <laughs> I walked a pathway of problems. I haven't always done everything right or good or been angelic all the time. Mm. The enemy made a fighter out of me. The devil caused me to get some discipline and become a disciple. Come on, son. Is there any fighters in the house? We got any real fighters in the house? We got any real people that are ready to fight? You ought to worship God right now. Show them I'm in this fight. I'm in this battle. For my battle. For my family. For my home. Let me say it like this. Now I know Brother Davenport's even got a bit of this in his stately old age. Uh-huh. Now I'm not going to tell the story, but I know it's in there and I heard it. See, see, sometimes you have to understand, I'm watching you. You're watching you, and you're creating your paradigm. I used the word a minute ago, spite. Come on now. Yeah. It's like, I get a little upset. I walk in the kitchen, and something I wanted is gone. And I find that Erica's got, Erica's got her own special little Pop-Tarts. I'm like, all right, I'll fix you. You, fi you finished all that strawberry soda? Watch this. Because you don't know where the Pop-Tarts went. Because I hit them in spite. That's small. That's silly. That's trivial. It's just us playing around. But how many of you, someone goes by you in traffic, you go, oh, no, you know I'm going to speed up. In spite. You know someone wants the same thing, and it's the last one there is, and you in spite. You know, oh, all the married folk are like, oh, Lord Jesus. <laughs> Half the things y'all do in your fight, in spite. Why? You're defending territory. Oh. Some of you ought to worship in front of the devil in spite. Some of you ought to be so faithful to the house of God, even in spite. Devil, you tried. You oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The devil tried to cut you up. Oh, no, you don't. You're not stealing my worship. You're not stealing. Even if I don't even feel it, I'm going to praise in spite. Devil, you didn't get me. Devil, you didn't stop me. The Bible says people perish for lack of knowledge. How many times you ever heard someone complain about a situation? You're like, what are you doing? They're playing you. They're playing you. Oh, no, you can't let them treat you. What are you doing? What they're saying is sometimes you, oh, no, don't get played. You're not an instrument. Hello? The devil's trying to play you like a guitar. Get your hands off my strings. I'm worshiping God. Get your hands off me. 
you're not going to play me. And I'm going to worship and read and pray because I will do it in spite of you. Listen, be seated. I got a long way to go. Y'all acting like I'm not finishing early. Y'all just need to hold on. I'm going to keep going in spite. Are you ready? The greater the anointing, the bigger the adversity. Because if you're really anointed, your anointing will demand adversity. If you're really anointed, see, I'll be honest with you, and, and, I, and I, I say this in all love, and I understand there's the up and downs and the vicissitudes of life. But if you're really anointed, your anointing will attract adversity. If you're really powerful, the enemy's going to throw problems at you. The devil cannot stand people that are not willing just to come and sit and take up a spot. He is upset by the real deal. <laughs> I'm talking about, you have to understand, the enemy gets sideways with a real apostolic, world-changing, Holy Ghost-filled, water-baptized, modern-day church worshiper and warrior. There's something about the enemy. He can't stand the faithful that are faithful day in and day out. Problems in, problem out, adversity in, adversity. They're still here. They're praising with all they got. They're worshiping with all they have. They're not diminished by destruction. They'll still stand there like David and say, bring me the ephod. You're looking for someone to pray for and your world's on fire. You're looking for someone to teach a Bible study to and everything seems to be falling apart. You're looking for another soul to reach and you're wondering where you're going to be tomorrow. Mm. My God, I'm talking about ministers. Mm -hmm. But I'm talking about folks that are anointed for whatever and not, this is my position, this is my title, and this is my job. The devil don't care about none of that. If you're concerned about that, he's got you where you, he wants you. Because if you ain't anointed and you ain't doing nothing, if there's no adversity, you ain't anointed for nothing. Why would God anoint you if you're not going to do anything? I ain't feel God. I don't feel this. I'm not, I'm not getting messages. I'm not making a difference in the kingdom. Well, maybe you should start making a difference in the kingdom and draw an anointing. Anointing demands afflictions and adversity. Listen, David's anointing demanded a giant. Nobody knew who he was. Nobody knew how anointed he was until he faced the giant. David wasn't made for the giant. The giant was there for David. Oh, good. we got any believers in here. We got anybody sick and tired of the hottest spot is your backside in your seat. Daniel's anointing demanded a lion's den. Elijah's anointing demanded a Jezebel and an Ahab. My God, when you're anointed, the devil's going to try to bring it equal to attack you. Oh, y'all missed that one. That went by you like a Maserati. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you're anointed, the devil's going to come at you. Look what he sent after David. They spent almost a whole chapter on that dude. The enemy wants to attack your anointing. He wants to afflict you out of your calling. So when he sees that you keep your heart right with God, you keep your mind right on the word of God, your, your spirit is under the authority of of God and you walk in a power like David did I don't care if you send five giants he's still going to walk in there with an attitude is that not a cause I'm anointed and if there's a problem that's what I'm built for that's what I'm anointed my anointing demands an adversary 
My anointing demands some adversity. That's why there's nothing like someone that sings from a place of pain, that worships in the midst of worry. Oh, y'all missing what I'm saying. See, see, you can't come in here and demand respect because of your longevity. Hello? Ain't no one talking about who won last year's Super Bowl. Kind of like, what have you done for me lately? Kind of stuff. Oh. oh my God. You will walk in power over the enemy when you're always, always fighting and resisting him and every attack that comes. If you're not anointed, he, anointed he's not going to attack. Abraham's anointed demanded a mountain and an only son. Paul and Silas' anointing demanded a prism. Peter's anointing demanded a storm. Oh, Lord. Your anointing demands an act. Are you going through something? Good. That means you're anointed. You got some problems and you're here. Good. You better. You ought to thank God. I'm anointed for this. Oh, I see. <laughs> You know, if a legion of devils is inside one man, how powerful that man used to be. How powerful was that guy? How powerful was that one man? But what, you know, wait a minute. And this is an original me. One of our colleagues said this. But if a legion or 2,000 devils got into one man, how small is that devil? That ought to put a little victory. Wait a minute. Let me straighten myself out here a little bit. Hold up, man. Why am I walking around with my head down? What am I, what am I walking around all the time? Wait a minute. You can put 2,000 jokers in one. Oh, man, you are, you mess with the wrong. You, you're a Paul to my Stephen. You'll fix it to get dropped. Don't come into my territory. Oh, don't stand in front of me. I'm going to mow you down and keep on going. And if I ever see you again, I'm just going to look at you. That tells you stop being fearful. Sister Crow said it multiple times, for God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. Look how great our God is. Look how wonderful he is to us. See, God is so great, the devil wants to get you to magnify everything that's wrong. You hear what I'm saying? Now, I don't want to hurt nobody's feelings. There's some of you, when I walk up to you, I say, praise the Lord, give you a fist bump and keep walking. Actually, I do that to everybody because I've got stuff going on. But there's some people, I don't say, how are you doing? Because I'm about to get an encyclopedia of problems. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not talking about real problems. I'm just talking, man, that's life. You miss church because you got a flat tire, you got a little bit of a headache. What? Are you kidding me? You, you, you couldn't pray because you what? You haven't, you haven't, if you've been in church for a year and you haven't read your whole Bible all the way through, what? In fact, I'll say this to everybody listen, everybody may ever hear this. If you haven't read your Bible, stop criticizing anybody. Don't you ever talk about a pastor or a preacher. Don't you ever condemn a pastor's wife or a bishop or a saint. Of God. You ain't read that. Bible. I'm going to say something. About it. Shut up. Live for God for a minute before you judge anybody. Don't you dare talk to someone in your, come out of your mouth. That, well, I'm going to be nice right here. You at, are you kidding me? It's going to come hard to you. You're going to destroy and tear. The Bible talks about women tearing down 
houses with her own hands. Mm -hmm. The enemy wants you to make a bigger deal out of all the drama and the struggle. He wants you to focus on what you're going through instead of who you're going through it with. Can I tell you where the Bible says the devil is great? Carol, I need you to hear this one. I say, come on, y'all need to hear this one. The Bible says the devil has greatness. Are you ready? Revelations 12 and 12. Listen to this. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath. Because he knoweth he hath but a short time. Now you remember we can fit 2,000 devils in one person. So forgive my analogy here, but you ever been around them little chihuahua dogs? <laughs> the devil has great wrath. He's <laughs> you know what that word wrath means translated passion it literally means as if breathing hard the dude's out of breath <laughs> he's passionate but he's out of breath and if you're out of breath you're this close to passing out because you know you got but a short time because basically can I say all the devil got against you is harsh language and accusations yeah. you're going to be defeated by harsh language and accusation oh he is the accuser of the brethren yeah. what am I saying so instead of magnifying what the devil is saying magnifying the wrath or the passion of your enemy do what David said and magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name to, oh man, I, I got three saved people in the house right now. I come to magnify, that's why I come to worship. That's why I come to praise. That's why I come to love the devil. No, I'm not magnifying what you're doing, devil. I'm magnifying what God When David said that, he was, had changed his behavior. He is acting up before Abimelech. Mm -hmm. David was in a tough time. But you know what he said? I will bless the Lord at all times. Yes. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear. No, the proud ain't going to hear this. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. You want to know if you're humble in here? You're glad about what I'm preaching. You're glad about people worshiping. You're excited about people shouting. You're good with people running and shouting and dancing and getting excited about the things of God. Oh, yeah, hear what I'm saying. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. David, you're on to something. He goes and includes that. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he... If you're constantly magnifying the devil, you can't be seeking the Lord. Mm. And delivered me, listen to this, from all my fears. Oh, wait a minute. You didn't say problems. Why? Because the wrath of the devil is not a problem. It's only a fear. Because all he can do is use harsh language and passion. I'm not just going to show up to church. I kind of magnify the Lord. Now, wait a minute. 
That almost doesn't make sense. Because God can't get any bigger. He already fills the universe. He's already everywhere. There's no other place for him to go. So what is David talking about? Remember, he was being pursued. He had problems. He had situations going on. So what's he talking about? Magnifying the Lord. He's saying, I need to magnify him so he fills me up and pushes out all my worry, pushes out all my anxiety, pushes out all my fear. Hey, I, I'm too full of the Holy Ghost and fire. I'm going through problems, but the problem just met its match because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. That's why I worship and praise and magnify and shout and I'm faithful because I know greater is he that's in me. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let's magnify him. Let's worship right now. I'm not making him bigger out there. I'm making him bigger in here. Oh, somebody give the Lord a praise right now. If you, I mean, if you know what I'm preaching, give the Lord a shout right now. Because when you realize that what's attacking you isn't as big as who's defending and delivering you. <laughs> when we moved across town in England, we left Cherry Road and went over to Round Hill Road. Parents bought a house over there. I started coming of age girls started getting involved now, I was kind of an anomaly now the guys hated me but you're as an American you were something different than them, all them jokers man he's an American so I drew some attention skinny rail and all <laughs> and so you know, you, 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 over there, you finish school at 16. Now, you think, oh, they get less school. No, they have more school before 16. I'm talking in grade school. You're not taking science. You're taking physics, chemistry, and biology. I'm, a, I'm an educated person. Now, education don't mean anything because it's not what you're taught. It's what you remember. Yes. That's education. Oh, helping, helping somebody. I got a degree on the wall. I don't care. You're dumb as a box of rocks. The old wisdom is knowledge applied. Oh, that'll help you later. Think, write that down and go look at it tomorrow when you're acting dumb. <laughs> and so one day I'm out there, you know, because I got to that age, I start, you know, you know, you start becoming aware because you start combing your hair. Yeah, I used, yeah, I used to have hair, guys. I used to have good hair, almost like as good as Brother Bruce. Maybe not quite. If I was his age and that kind of hair, I'd be a little proud too. I'd be like, hey, Brother Crow, what? <laughs> I got that little yarmulke working on the back of my head. It ain't so little no more. I'm full-fledged yarmulke now. Don't worry, babe. I'm just gaining faith. She won't let me buzz it off, but it's, it's coming. Knowledge keeps me from doing it. <laughs> so anyway, I'm out there doing my thing. The next thing I know, I'm talking to this girl, Dawn. Now, I'm 13, and she's already out of school. And so she'd go by in the mornings, call up to my room as I, I'm getting ready for school, and she's on her way to work. Jesus, hey, John. Yeah. You know. I went to church. It was, hey, you think, you, you think you're all that in a bag of chips when you got, she's an older woman. <laughs> It's all good when you're that age, but when you get, well, we won't go there. Come on, amen, gentlemen. So anyway, anybody met, anybody know? Now, see, in England, they had the real ones. You know what a skinhead is? A mod. A mod they had, it was the dumbest thing. They wore a target on their back. That wouldn't be good today, but anyway. 
His name was Bill. He was a big old bomber jacket, steel-toed, airwear, boot-wearing dude. And here I am, I'm about the size of a straw. But I'm pulling him in, you know what I'm saying? And Bill didn't like that because I was taking territory. Now, the benefit of being a straw, now, I was athletic, don't get me wrong. I ran for my school. I was doing martial arts. I played soccer on a team, okay? Which benefited me. Because that big old boy could not catch me. <laughs> now, Paul, I thought, but Bill made me run. Y'all think that ain't Bible, bro? You just said it fine. The Bible says, flee youthful lust. <laughs> that boy gonna kill me. Man, I could run around the block before that dude could get even half a one. But I could pick him up and put him down. I was so fast back that back then, I'd race people on bikes and win. Now my, my knocking rickety old knees can't hardly get me across the church, but I did used to be able to run. What I'm saying is, is I had this big old boy come at me. I remember one time he was coming. Andrew, Don's sister said, hey, look, and Bill, he was on me. He was on me. I felt like a gazelle surrounded by a pride of lion. Man, I started booking and cooking, man. You Man, I hit my front door and flew in there so fast. And I piled up on the stairs. My dad looks at me, what you doing? I said, that guy's fixing to kill me. My dad looked out the door and went, and realized, that's a boy, that's a man. My dad was like, oh, no, you ain't messing with my son. My dad took off after, I got to see Bill run. I got to see, I got to see the bottom of his shoes. My dad behind, he was just, see, you got a heavenly father. Oh, you don't know. Get to the house and get your daddy. At, oh, you, you, you're coming. You ought to get your praise and worship Paul. Yeah. I ain't walking in this fire by myself. You should have seen me behind my dad. Yeah, yeah, boy. Right. I was bad now. I wasn't afraid now because all of a sudden my daddy was between my problem and me. Oh, yeah. You run now, boy. I had a big mouth there. See, you ought to get a big mouth in here. Devil, yeah, you can't touch me. I, I got a daddy. You can't touch me. He says I'm here. He, God, that's mine. You ain't touching mine. Get your hands off mine. I'll be with you through the flood. I'll be with you in the fire. Yeah. Yeah. Sit down. I got to wrap this Bible study up, man. We, I, man it, it's quarter to lunch, and I'm not done. The Bible said that the heat of the fiery furnace is seven times hotter. Why did they do that? Simply because three people stood their ground. Because three people said, we're not bound. Because people said, you know what? I'm not swayed by watching others falter. If I got to come in and sit on the front row by myself while others backslide, okay, I'm... Mm. I'm not afraid of what they're saying, the music they're playing, or what they're doing out there. I'm not deterred by a decree. I'm not worried about the problem. Those three guys said, nope. Nope. That's for me and my house. We're going we're gonna to serve the Lord. We're going to be at the church. Mm -hmm. Everyone around us might be compromising and backsliding and becoming cold and lukewarm. Not me. I'm going to get on fire. Ah, hallelujah. You can compromise, but I'm not. Do I got any I'm nots in the house? Those are going to stand for what's right. Going to get behind the pastor. Going to get behind the church. Going to be involved. We ain't missing. We're going to be involved. I'm going to get right in there. Despite what others do, despite what my neighbors do, despite what they say. Even if my own family bows and quits, you're going to find me at church. Been there, done it, proved it. Let me just say this to some of you young people. You need to make up your mind. 
like these guys. You do not have to do what them foolish kids are doing out there. I don't care, and it don't matter what your friends are doing. You got to get something inside you. I believe that God's getting ready to use you. You don't have to be a t statistic. You don't have to fall in all that mess. You don't have to. You don't have to get out there giving yourself to a bunch of fools that don't even know what being a man is. Look. Stop looking for approval from those that don't matter. Hey, this ain't just for young people, adults. You need to stop. That whole world, you can't listen. They're going to tell you it's more important to have a manicured lawn. Spend all your time on that and have a weak and human spirit. Have a nice car. But you don't make a difference in the church. Have a full refrigerator and a full bank account. But you're not a blessing in that one. Stop worrying about keeping up with the Joneses and making sure you're walking with Jesus. <clears throat> be who God called you to be. You ought to be in prayer. Who am I to be today? Not this is what I'm going to do today. God, God, how can God call you to something higher when you're always chasing after something lower? Because when you're looking for other people's approval, you make them your God. When you're looking for people to be excited about what you're driving or what you own or what you've achieved, you're making their, your, them your God. If you get your little rooster up because, man, people know, yeah, I'm successful. You make them your God. There's nothing more empowering than getting to that place. I care nothing about anybody's applause but the applause of one. I'm going to let you know right here and right now, I could give a rip what you think of me. I'm not doing this for you. I'm not coming here for you. I'm not coming here to please you. I'm coming here to magnify God, to exalt him, to praise him. Ah, despite what you want, uh, you can look down on me if you dare, criticize me, ridicule me. I'm not here for you. I'm here for God. Easily offended, our people are already defeated people. That's why the devil's tactics work on you. They lack intestinal fortitude. They got a weak spirit. They're, they're rude when you call them on it because their idea of strength is rudeness. Yeah. They're critical of anointed people. Like David's wife, Michael. She was more Saul's daughter than David's wife because she despised the worship of her husband. In fact, he laid down his kingly garments to, to, to exalt the Lord even more. He was a worshiping mad man. And you know what he did? He sent. There's something about, you understand, if you desire the office of ministry, you want to be spiritual, and you go and you send people to their homes to take God home. David shows us you've got to have a mandate to take it home for yourself. And just because you take it home doesn't mean it's going to be accepted. Because even though Michael couldn't get up to worship God, she sure got up to get in David's face. When you 
get a Jezebel or you get a bad spirit, a backslidden person in your face at your house, you know what he told her? I didn't do it for you. In fact, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but I'm not even here for you. In fact, I brought God home to anoint my house. Bless my house. In fact, now that I realize you're not only opposing me, but you're now opposing my God, I'm going to worship more. In fact, I'm going to, oh, you have no idea. Remember that in spiteness? He's saying, in spite of what you're doing, in spite of what you're saying, in spite of all, all problems you're causing me, I'm going to be more dedicated. I'm going to be a better worshiper. Oh, your, your anointing demands an adversary. David saying to Michael, you didn't save me. You didn't anoint me. I will not bow to your pressure. I will not conform to your demands, wife. I will not concede my calling for you. I'm not here to worship you. I'm here to only worship God. Why was David there? David was fresh off defeat and loss and he wasn't about to go back to that for nobody. I failed long enough. I messed up long enough. I've been anointed and it got tabled. It got sideswiped because I messed up. Well, I don't care who you are. When I come home, me and my house, we will serve the Lord. In fact, you have to, he was so anointed that the Bible says Michael was barren. Be careful. Don't bow to the barren. Don't bow to the barren. See what I'm saying? If someone here needs to remember like David did when God forgave you. When he pulled you out. When he delivered you. Remember that? And like David, well, wait a minute. Yeah, I could have died in that mess. I could have lost everything. But God. I could have fallen apart. But God. So the Bible says they heated the furnace seven times hotter. Now I did a little bit of research, not a lot, a little, and more than I can give here, but the walls of Babylon were made from brick. Babylon was known. In fact, the famous Ishtar Gate was a gated entrance to an inner wall in the city. The area inside the walls included gardens and farms, as well as buildings and a full-size pyramid, all made of bricks and palm wood. The walls were said to enclose up to 196 square miles. That's why there were fiery furnaces, because of all the bricks they were making. In fact, to this day, they're still using some of those bricks to build. But what's interesting about those bricks is every one of them at least got the name of Nebuchadnezzar on them. Go online, look it up, they'll show you. Some had inscriptions, some had sayings, but they all had the name Nebuchadnezzar on them. Mm -hmm. It was either stamped or inscribed in cuneiform. It is said that, listen, the inscription is translated as Nebuchadnezzar, which literally means Nebo, protect the boundary. He was so proud of it that in Daniel 4.30 it says, he says, is this not the Babylon that I built? Modern research says that Nebuchadnezzar was the greatest monarch that Babylon or the East had ever produced. He he had enormous command over everybody in his province. Is this not? So those furnaces were used for curing bricks. And now he says, you're going to heat this one seven times hotter because we're not cooking bricks. We're cooking folks. Why? Because when you're a Meshach, when you're a Shradrach, Bendigo. The enemy's going to turn the heat up a little bit. Ooh. Now, I'm going to say something you're not expecting to say. You need to stop complaining that you have it harder than other folks. You may have it harder. But the only reason you do is because hell sees something greater in you than it sees in a... Turn the heat up. Turn the heat up on that person. Turn the heat up on them. 
They're too committed. Turn the heat up. They're too dedicated. Turn it up. They're too anointed. Your anointing draws adversity. And the enemy knows God uses you mightily. So it feels like the heat's being turned up. And it feels like you're getting more, more than your share of the pain. It means that the enemy knows God has an amazing plan for your life. God's got an amazing plan for your situation. The Bible says he used the most mighty men to throw them in. Why? They're three defeated guys, right? They're three young guys. And you get the most mighty. My God put me through this. Well, why'd they ask the mighty men? It was a compliment. See, I laugh at you guys, young guys walking around here flexing your biceps. That's a compliment when you try to show off. Because if I didn't matter, you wouldn't want to show me. Because you know you can't got it like Brother Crow did. Or had. I'm, I'm going to come back. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. The most mighty man. Who? Who's afraid of who here? Mm. When you have a mindset that you got to tie these guys up and use the most mighty men, imagine this, the mightiest men, those usually guarding the king or those important foot soldiers, the king's like, hey, wait a minute. You mighty fellows over there, come here. No, not you common soldiers, not you stud muffins. I want the mighty men. I want the cream of the crop. I want to, that's a compliment. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that, that's a, oh, that's a platform. It spoke more about those three Hebrews than the squad of the most mighty. Mm. What's this teach us? The greater the attack, the greater the compliment from hell. The greater the enemy, the greater the fear the enemy has of you. Oh, see, I want to say this. Some of you need to see how the enemy sees you. You need to see you and recognize you how he does. See, some of us only hear what the enemy has to say because it's passion and great wrath and not what he says about us. I know we got a sore tongue. And they're bad to the bone. Remember Gideon, mighty man of valor? He was so afraid. He said, wait a minute. See what he did? I need you to hear what they're saying about you. If you'd only hear what the enemy's saying about you. If you only could hear instead of sitting here and worrying and you could hear what the enemy's saying about you, he's worried that you get back to your calling, that you get back to that place of anointing. He's so worried. He's so, you're, you're worried about him and he's scared to death of you. Michael was scared to death that the king, the anointed king, was coming back home and she wanted to stop him. You ain't getting a foothold. I'm ruling this house. And he walked in and said, get beside me. Uh-huh. The Bible says in Judges that he sent him down. And in Judges 7, 11, it says, and afterward, then thou shalt hear what they say. The enemy. So he sent him down there, and he went there with Purah as his servant and said, at Gideon 7, 13, 14, and Gideon has, was come. Behold, there was a man that told a dream unto his fellow and said, Behold, I dreamed a dream. They're dreaming about you. Not like that, but they're dreaming. Unto his fellow and said, Behold, I dreamed a dream. And look, this is hilarious. Lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled. You know it's a nightmare when you're dreaming about cupcakes. Come on, man. Yeah. <laughs> bread tumbled into the host of Midian and came unto a tent and smote it and fell. You got cupcakes dropping tents. I, I, I want, you know, the Bible's right, but I, I, that's not a dream. That's a nightmare when you got cupcakes destroying your life. See, you may think of yourself as a cupcake going to battle, but they don't, you know what I'm saying? They know your cupcake's bigger than anything. Uh. And it fell and overturned it that the tent lay along. And his fellow answered and said, this is nothing else 
See, see, they're dreaming about cupcakes, but they, this is the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel, for into his hand hath God delivered Midian and all the host. They were having nightmares about you. The enemy's having nightmares. He's tormented. He's full of wrath because he's got a short time and he's getting dropped by cupcakes. He's getting dropped by dessert food. All that you could hear the enemy's fears about you when you're worshiping in the house of God, when you're faithful in the house of God, when you're determined and committed, you need to understand something. When you're living for God, you're the enemy's worst nightmare. Are you ready for a change in your attitude? Are you ready to become your enemy's worst nightmare? So they bound them, cast through them into the burning fiery furnace. And it was so hot that the most mighty men died. Yeah. Psalms kind of backs up my thought today. Before I was afflicted, Psalms 1967, I went astray. truth so I can get my mind and heart and life right. I need pastor to preach it. Preach my nightmare. <coughs> so I'll keep the word. Affliction will reignite your need for the anointing. Casual Christianity destroys a calling. Comfort will defeat your anointing. What am I saying? There's no denying how hot the furnace was. It was as hot as hell as they could create on earth. Sometimes you need to be surrounded by all kinds of hell to remind you of the heaven that's in you. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Oh, you know. When Nebuchadnezzar looked into the furnace, he's like, one, two, three, four. He's like, wait a minute, guys. Didn't we throw four in, three in there? Wait a minute, counselors. Help me with my arithmetic. I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I'm having trouble with my addition. One, two, three, four. Now, I'm not sure, but if I had witnessed that, and I was the one who ordered those guys thrown in there. I might be looking for an exit. Wait. Because that extra guy didn't look like any other man. Nebuchadnezzar said it himself. Uh, wait a minute. To hold on. That, that other one looks different. Now, the Bible never says the three Hebrew boys knew who the fourth man in the fire was. It never says that they even saw the fourth man. But it sure lets us know the enemy saw. If only you could see you and how your enemy sees you. They ain't walking alone. They're not by themselves. They're in the fire and they're walking with a son of God. They're walking, oh my God. There's something about these guys. This is why the enemy understands the church folk, the saint of God, better than you and I do. We don't always see what's helping us. We think in the middle of our battle when everything's falling apart, we feel alone. We feel like I'm going through this alone. I, I, what am I going to do in this situation? How's this going to get fixed? And the enemy's sitting back there. I hope they don't. I hope they don't see and realize that even in this fire, 
They ain't by themselves. We don't always see what's helping us, but the enemy does. The enemy knows right well who's walking with us, talking with us, defending us, delivering us, going through uh, with us in the fire. Nebuchadnezzar said, I see four men loose and walking. Wait a minute ago, they were bound. Now they're loose. They were bound and down. Now they're loose and walking. The fire, the heat, the plan to kill them and destroy them, God used to free them. Stop complaining about that trial that God's using to free you. Oh, you ought to give God a praise for that. Instead of ending them, it set them free. It was supposed to harm and hurt but it set them free. It blows the enemy's mind when he sees what he did to you. That should have ruined you. It should have destroyed you. You should be down in depression and anxiety. You should be on medication and cause you to quit and die. You should be ruined. Uh, your testimony destroyed by torment. Torment. But instead, it looses you. And you're shouting. And you're worshiping. And you're dancing. And you're running. And you're praising God in the fire. Not only did he heat it too hot. Not only did he throw them in, but Nebuchadnezzar made another mistake. The furnace was too big. He gave them worship room. They got up. They were walking around. They had room to celebrate. They were thrown down, but they got up. They celebrated. They got back up walking in the midst of what should have killed them. I know there's enemies after you and I. And we've been through some stuff. But look around the room. You're back up and you're walking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah they, they, they said you wouldn't survive. But you're here. They're declaring that it's over for you. But you're here. The enemy wanted to see you fall. They want to see you hurt. They want to see you destroyed. But they're watching you walk around with your Savior in the fire. They wanted you to fail. They wanted you to fall. They wanted to watch you burn. But instead, they're watching you walking, celebrating in the fire. I got one last point to make. It says the princes, the governors, and the captains, and the king's counselors all gathered together, saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power. Nor was a hair of their head singed, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire passed on them. It says they were untouched. But it goes deeper than that. It was more than just what you could see and touch. It says... You couldn't even smell that they'd been through the fire. Ooh. <laughs> you know why? Because there's always those smoke detecting folks in the church. I know what you did. They go around sniffing, sniffing out the worst stuff about you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sin sniffers. Yeah, I, 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 let, me, let me just talk to some critical spirited people here. Because you need deliverance from that. Some of the self-righteous. For a second. I'm talking love. Look at all. Oh. Let's see if they last this time. I don't know why he or she's worshiping like that. I remember what they were doing a few weeks ago. What? God's using him? 
Here we go again. Sin sniffers. Smoke sniffers. You know? They want you to not forget the fire you were in. They don't want you to forget what used to be. See, to make the fire your focus is keep the trial. It's more important than your deliverance. I got news for you. When God delivers you, when God delivers someone, not only will they not look, because the Bible says their hair, their color, nothing changed. They won't look like they've been through the furnace of trials. Uh, oh, you can try to dig up their past and stiff around all you want to, but who the Son has set free is free indeed. See, see, you don't understand. Let me bring this to a close. We have a testimony that everybody knows about. And then we have the honest testimony that nobody knows. Mm. That stuff nobody knows about. We all talk about the healing, deliverance, and, and God helped me through this, and God helped me through that, and we give God glory for, well, he blessed me and touched my, but we don't talk about the stuff that nobody. <laughs> you know, not the testimony stuff, but the stuff we were ashamed of, stuff that we were bound by. Because when God got you out of that secret stuff, you escaped the death sentence unscathed and smelling like a roll. <laughs> you survived something. Yeah, it should have ended you. It should have followed you. It should have burned you up. We should smell it on you. You ought to praise God. For all the things that didn't stick to you. You ought to give him glory for all the stuff you survive ain't nobody know about. There's not a, oh, you need to get real in here and stand to your feet because he bailed you out and nobody knows about. Give God thanks. Because the devil can't sniff out what you did. There's a critical lady in the church and she walked up to the pastor and said, God's been talking to me about you. Cool. So he said, I'll tell you what. The next time God talks to you about me, What did he say? The pastor, he said, I don't remember. You need to praise God for your real testimony. Your real testimony. <laughs> Not the stuff you can tell folks about, but the stuff your spouse don't even know about. Uh, that stuff your family don't know about. Oh, yeah. When you acted a fool, like, oh, God, Jesus, get, get me out of this one you ought to shout this place down over what didn't stick to you all that junk no one knows about see because people that make it out of the fire don't care what other people think yeah I don't care what you think I'm here to worship God I don't care if you think I'm a good pastor or not I don't give a flying rip In fact, I'll tell you, don't come to me what you know about other people. Sin sniffer. You're on the wrong side of this team. We're here to worship our Savior. 
We're here to worship the one that we can go through the fire and not even smell like what we've been through. You ought to give God praise. You ought to, you ought to shout this house down on what didn't stick to you. Where the real folks at? Where the real, real redeemed people at? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you know you shouldn't. You shouldn't even have survived it. Never mind not smell. Let's lift up our hands and love God right now.